So over the past few weeks, I've been having a lot of fun just kind of jumping in to playing other instruments. This is not something that I've uh, really done much of. I've kind of always just had the mentality that, oh, I'm just a drummer. I don't really play guitar or bass or even sing. And I started really challenging that idea. I've been, um, you know, dealing with some stress and just kids that are, have been home all summer. And I don't know, it's just been a really good outlet for me just to take an acoustic guitar and just sit in the corner of my bedroom and just kind of noodle around on some low notes, kind of like some classical guitar type stuff. And some of it's like, okay, like a minor scale, you know, over like a droning E, for example. And that would do wonders to get me through the night. And I was on the brink of implosion, but doing some minor harmonic scale over a drone and E really saved my ass. So I started really leaning into that. And I started playing other guitars and picking up bass. And so I've you know, really started incorporating this stuff into the studio here. Now, this is to say that I've been wanting to do this for a while, and I've really needed just more music and less of other people's songs. Not that I don't care about other people, but there's so much more to be had than just watching over and caring for other people's music and helping them develop that. You have to have your own outlet. And I just can't believe I didn't do this any earlier. So uh, with all that said, um, I have kind of a <laughs> kind of a rough song here, super basic, but that's the idea is I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to play a bunch of like four fingered chords and stuff like that. Like I'll play two notes two note chords until I get better, right? I'm sure I can make songs using one and two note chords and do some riff rock kind of stuff. So today's song is uh, done completely by myself. And um, I want to talk to you about the drum track today. The drums are, um, I mean, they sound great. I, I couldn't be happier with how the drums sound. But I started experimenting with this idea of running your own samples and just doing quick little one hits after the session is over. You know, literally just taking 10 extra seconds and hit the drum three or four times. That's all I did. And in everything today that I did, I didn't even do multiple samples. I literally just grabbed a single hit and ran over here and loaded it in to uh, Slate Trigger. So a single hit, no, you know, dynamic difference, no round robin samples that kind of rotate through the same dynamics, none of that. This is just a single hit, okay? And I want to show you probably four or five different benefits to even just doing this. And I've talked a lot in the past about not using samples. I still stand by that. And specifically though, what I was speaking against was using somebody else's sample. It's very important that if you use samples, that it's of the drum kit that you've been recording. It matches the aesthetic of the song. It matches the aesthetic of your studio. After all, the studio is your most important piece of gear. That reflection and vibe of your room that's unique to you and those drums are unique to your session it's one of the reasons why i advocate recording a song per day you set up everything as you need it you tear it down you don't just do 10 drum tracks in a row because every time you set up the drums it is more work but every song is slightly unique and the momentum is just huge day by day you build the song and the band is just completely engaged so this idea of just being authentic to creativity authentic to your sounds and that's where this comes in these are my drums these are not some drums that were recorded in ocean way studio right that would sound fake it'd be a lot like having a stock photograph if I were to take a picture of myself 
and do my absolute best to get this amazing lighting, even edit the photo, it's still going to look like me. But if I just go and type in recording studio singer at microphone, I'm going to get a picture that it just doesn't look right. In fact, it looks too perfect. Um, something about it, the lighting, I don't know, but it just looks too perfect. And so it would stick out like a sore thumb on my website and my videos. I just couldn't use it. You would know right away it's a stock photo. But if I even freeze frame a shot of the video or take my own photos, it'll work. And so we're talking about embracing those imperfections from the samples. So rolling your own samples, just doing some quick one hits, really makes all the difference in the world. And the techniques that we're talking about today really isn't about replacing. It's about uh, just strengthening the drums that are there. So I have some tracks set up. I have the regular kick track. And then I have the, uh, I have a send going to this channel here. This is just an effect track. And it goes into a trigger. And that's the inside mic. And then I also have the room sound. And so what I'm getting is the sound of the room without any cymbal bleed. Okay, and you can repeat this on the snare, on the toms, everywhere. So you're able to get and dial in and out the room, but more so you can turn down the cymbals and you can turn down the room mic. So you can really actually do a very direct sound, but still have a roomy sound because you're able to turn down the cymbals. You don't need the room mics anymore to get you that dimension. You can, you can use actually your real samples to do that. So um, let me just kind of show you exactly what I'm talking about here. Yeah, so that's the that's the kind of vibe that that I have going for now. Um, you know, again, these are pretty basic guitar parts, right? Um, I want to say I heard a story about you too. How when they first started, they just kind of made songs based on what they could do and what could, what they could pull off consistently with each of their parts, and they kind of leaned into that. So, you know, these guitar parts aren't hard. Uh, of course, you guys can hear that, but. Um, Man, it's been so amazing just to create something and be able to use like all this gear that I have. It's ridiculous, like the stuff that I have. Like, you know, I got to use it. So, back to the samples here. You can hear me kind of pull up this kick room thing uh, and the, uh, the inside mic. Just kind of solo this. I have everything going to basically a kick bus. I have this little dash here. And so I have the regular track going there. Then I have the kick trigger track going there. And then I have a kick room track going there. Actually, no, it's going to the drums. So that's incorrect. But um, that's because it's a roomy sound. So I don't want to compress the sound. And, you know, here's my compression. So I'm treating everything together as it were, you know, one thing, okay? So the kick and the trigger. So 
So you can hear that. That's definitely a sample, you know? But it is a sample of my drum, and that's the big difference here. Here is just the kick track. Okay? Now, what's really great about this technique is you can really go heavy on the mix for the sub. So we have the outside mic, basically. And I want to say I just filtered out a bunch of the top end. And so I have this outside mic with no cymbal bleed. And we can, well, we don't really even have to compress it because it's going to be pretty consistent. But we can basically insinuate consistency in the low end of our mix because we're sneaking this in. So the top end would give it away. You know, if if we could hear that the sample was really loud in our mix, it'd be it'd be um, very obvious if the top end was super consistent. Um, but there's no top end to this. We're just adding basically a layer of consistency in the low end here. Okay, and then I can use just the inside mic, or I could do a mix like I was doing, um, or I could do the room. So, you know, that's the first couple of things you can do with this is you can really maintain the control of the low end. You can main control, uh, maintain control of just the general dynamics and do it, you know, very subtly. Uh, let's hear it on snare. And this, you know, I wouldn't go about, uh, probably about 50%, um, but it's just going to add in some consistency. So that's just the sample, and then I can kind of do a mix here. So that's a uh, kind of tip two is that you get consistency um, in general, and it's going to sound stronger, more consistent. It's going to sound more like Dave Grohl, okay? Just every hit is the same. Um, again, not more than about 50% mix, okay? Now, in that, you're going to do basically less of the snare drum in the mix because you have kind of two tracks now for snare, so you'll need a little bit less of each of those two tracks. And less cymbal bleed. So you used to have to deal with a lot of hi-hat bleed in the snare mics, but if you kind of split the, the load between your snare mic with the hi-hat bleed and the snare trigger, well now all of a sudden you can use a little bit less of both mics and you can bring down that hi-hat bleed because you have to use a little bit less of the actual snare mic. So that's um, technique three, I guess. I don't know, I've, I've kind of lost count, but technique three. Uh, then we have the ability to change the room. And this is really cool for like floor tom, for snare especially. Um, so we can really throttle the room up and down. Let me 
to just take the room triggers out. And these are literally the just the same hit that I'm sampling here. This is the close mic, and this is for the tom. I've done this on every every close mic drum. So snare, tom, floor tom, um, all four drums have this technique. And I have the direct mic, and then I have the room of that same sample. So I can just bring up the room sound of that one hit, and there is zero cymbal bleed in that. So um, really, really pretty cool technique. Let's see here. Let's go ahead and take the room out. Just show you what stuff sounds like. Yeah, so this is the real room mic. This is the real deal, and it sounds great. Um, it's a R88 by AEA, and it's up here, way up there. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be far away. Room mics don't have to be far away. They could be literally a cardioid mic, 57, faced away from the drum set and only a few feet, you know, in front of the drum set. So just face it away from the drum set, and you're fine. Uh, it could be a figure eight only a few feet in front of the drum set. For this, I just figured, oh, why not? I'll try something different. So I just put it up high just to see what would happen. So this is the room mic. It's got a lot of symbols in it. Okay. Let's do that same kind of mix, but instead we'll do it with the sampled room sound. Come in here, add some kick room, some snare room. I'll add it in a little as we go. So, no cymbal bleed in that. That's pretty awesome. Um, so we have control over the high end. We have really good control because a lot of times the cymbals can get into those room mics. We can compress them. Um, it, just, it just becomes overwhelming in the mix, mostly through overheads, tom mics, room mics. So with this, we have really good control sonically, but also with the levels of those symbols. So you see how little symbols I can I can go. So I can really turn down those overheads and get control over the Yeah, so that's, um, what are we at, five now, I guess? Um, we get really good control over those symbols. So let's move on to six. Um, this is one of the coolest ones. And as we go to these floor tom and, I guess, high tom, um, actually kick would be something to do this on, too, is instead of just taking the, uh, the sample what we can do is we can actually detune it some. And so 
what we have is we have a kind of deepening of the sound of the drum. And it's pretty cool. It kind of like rubs it in a cool way, like it conflicts a little bit and has like a, kind of some wobble. But it sounds really cool. Yeah, so we can really increase the perception of how deep that tom actually is. It's a way to just kind of sneak in some extra flavor, some extra enhancement. You know, I always say that the, the top end needs to be natural, and you typically choose microphones based on balancing out, complementing that top end. So we, a lot of times we'll go for a darker mic to complement the high end. However, in the low end, we typically try to enhance it, and we actually do the opposite. We actually use a mic that has good low end and actually makes it bigger and more powerful. We want it bigger than life. And so for something like a floor tom, this is kind of leaning into that technique. We are, uh, we're basically enhancing and increasing uh, the low end and making it sound bigger than life. Now, we can do this with kick, and I've, I've done that here, uh, but I want to move on to the next tip, so tip, I guess, seven, I guess it is, is, and I don't know if this is actually going to work. It might work for you. I was experimenting with this a little bit, is you take the, um, you know, you take the floor tom, and then you pan the trigger to the other side. And it kind of creates this quasi faux like double. So it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if it really works or not. Some of you may disagree, but it's kind of cool. Uh, let's check it out. hear it here's without here's with and then here's just locked in with the original track uh, right here Yeah, so I mean, either one works. Of course, we have uh, control of the room. I mean, you can really, really, you know, make these drums larger than life. And I haven't said this before, but just about all these tracks are pretty much raw. There might be a compressor or one EQ here or there. I was trying to experiment with just using the attack of the floor tom, panning that, but, I mean, that track's not even in right now. Um, you know, on the low-end kick, there's a couple of pull techs just to do the, the pull track, the low-end pull track trick, but these tracks are pretty much unmixed, okay? And without doing a bunch of processing, we're able to get this sound out of the gate, which is important because if we can do less later, then we're gonna get a better result. Okay, it's just like over EQing something. Um, it's not gonna sound very good when you take an over EQed mix, you go out your car and you listen, you're gonna have tons of surprises. If you don't really touch EQ and you just mix with compression and levels and you use mic position on the recording day, 
then you go out to your car, you're going to have an amazing sounding mix. So the less you can do through EQ and all that phase shift, the better. Um, so yeah, this was kind of a, a different video for me. I've spent so much time speaking against drum samples uh, over the years. But um, yeah, I'm just curious uh, what you think of this video, uh, kind of these tips. And um, if you have any ideas for future videos, I'm all ears. I'll see ya.